when you eat beans, see, because all carbohydrates can be scored on a hierarchical scale of quality. And one of the things we use to score the quality, besides the fiber content and the nutrient content, the micronutrients, is the amount of resistant starch in the food. Mm -hmm. And beans are the richest source of resistant starch, which means that a portion of the carbohydrates are not able to be enzymatically degraded. And because of that, it can't be utilized as calories. They're instead fermented by bacteria in the gut. Right. Now, the more you eat these beans on a regular basis, you get build up the bacteria that digests them better, and you stop producing gas from them. Ah, there you go. <laughs> now, when you're eating the greens and beans and mushrooms, and when you're eating all these foods in, in, in your diet, the bacterial biofilm becomes more adherent to the villi in the small intestines. See, the small intestines is, is like a hose, right? That's a curly hose going all around. And the lumen at the center of the hose has like a peach fuzz, mm-hmm. or like a, a felt on the interior wall, the lining, that's like, um, that are like the villi, or like finger-like projections, right. um, increasing the surface area by more than tenfold. And stuck onto those villi, that surface, are these adherent, this adherent bacteria biofilm that, produce, that, that builds up because you eat a regular bean eater, you eat green vegetables, beans, and mushrooms, and onions, and raw onion, and you build up this adherent biofilm. Now, this adherent biofilm lowers the glucose, the, the rate at which glucose passes through the villi now. So when you eat a mango or some oatmeal, the glycemic load of that oatmeal is lower, and the mango is lower. Is that right? Not as much glucose. It takes longer to get the glucose into your bloodstream. So your insulin response isn't as high. So well, it's protective against diabetes, makes you live longer. And weight gain, I'm assuming. And protective against weight gain. Yeah. Now, this is much more effective than taking probiotics or taking yogurt or taking sauerkraut or fermented foods because those um, bacteria pass through you. Whereas mm-hmm. when, you eat, when you build up the healthy bacteria by eating right, the biofilm and the, hev- the favorable microbiome is more adherent, means it lives there, it remains there, it takes up more permanent residence there. Mm. And, it's, and scientists call that the second meal effect. What that means is not only the meal when you eat the beans, but the meals when you're not eating beans, you're getting the benefit from eating beans. Mm. So you're getting benefit from eating the beans in up subsequent meals, and they call it the second meal effect, but it's really the third, fourth, fifth meal. It means any meal you eat, if you're a regular eater of beans, is going to have benefits as far as nutrient production, as far as lowering the glycemic effect. Because of your intestine. Because of the intestine microbiome from becoming a regular bean eater. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I was going to ask you about probiotics and enzymes. I, I take, uh, I forget what it's called, Digest Gold or something. Mm-hmm. It has probiotics and enzymes in it. But you're saying... I'm saying you don't need that stuff. Diet is the best way to get when you it. Don't, when you eat right, you don't need that stuff. Right. right. What about fiber? I, I, I love taking like psyllium husk or something at night. Mm-hmm. It helps. It just makes everything easier. I'm a big <laughs> proponent of that. Do you... We know broccoli has an incredible nutrient called indole-3-carbinol in it. Uh-huh. But there's a thousand other nutrients in it, too. The most active ingredient in broccoli is the broccoli. <laughs> what do you mean? It's the fiber? No, it's everything that's in the broccoli. <laughs> oh, it's just the whole thing. It's the whole thing. So when you're taking the fiber, you're taking this, you're taking that. I'm saying if you... No, the Americans are eating 10 grams of fiber a day. You eat a healthy diet, you're getting 50, 60 grams of fiber a day. Right. You're getting, you know, you're getting tons of fiber. So Why would you take more fiber? Your diet, if you're eating the right foods, your diet has all the fiber you need. If you're eating the right foods, you're having all the microbiome. We don't need the digestive enzymes. You're eating the right food anyway. People are going to have to listen to this podcast on half speed. <laughs> so some people speed them up because the guests are Am too I slow. Fast? No, I love it. Okay. This is exciting. <laughs> talking about G bombs here. G bombs. G B O M. Let me see if I can do it. Greens, Greens. beans, onions, mm. mushrooms, berries, and seeds. Seeds. You left off seeds. Shit. I got <laughs> flax seeds right there, man. That's because of you. I started putting flax seeds in my smoothie, and now I'm worried that smoothies are bad. <laughs> are oh. smoothies good? Yeah, sure. <laughs> how could you be worried? And you know, it's like, how could a person not eat flax seeds? Tell how me about flax seeds. Not eat flax see, seeds. this is the jukebox portion. Let's just talk about flax seeds. Like a recent study is. They followed women who had breast cancer for 10 years. Those who had a, a third of a milligram of lignin in the diet, and flax seeds are the highest lignin-containing food, mm-hmm. had a 71% reduction in dying of breast cancer over that 10-year period. Now, we'll keep in mind here that when you eat a food to protect against cancer, the effects go down as your cancer advances. As you age older, there's more effects when you're younger before you have the cancer. Right. It's still like, reduced breast cancer risk of death for 71% even when they had cancer. Is that right? You know, so that means it's, the effect would have been much more powerful had they taken it. And they only had a third of a milligram of lignin. A, a tablespoon of flaxseed has 21 milligrams of lignin in it. <laughs> 21 milligrams. <laughs> and it lowers blood pressure more than blood pressure medications do. And it lowers cholesterol. And it has an effect, beneficial effect on brain, brain function and on, mm. on, on mood. And those mm-hmm. who are talking here about flax seeds, chia seeds, sesame seeds, seeds that's why the S and G bombs. These, each, each food individually in the G bomb list, the greens, the beans, lower cancer rates by a tremendous pro- amount. But if we put together a diet with a portfolio 
of all these foods that have powerful anti-cancer effects, longevity promoting effects, that's where the magic happens. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. Right, it's frustrating for me because people don't know that the greatest tasting foods can be super healthy. And I can make, you know, that's what I do for a living is make, you know, healthy foods taste great. And what, are you kidding me? Healthy version tastes better than that junk food version you're eating that's going to kill you. Right. You know, I, whatever. Right? But I did hear you talking about p- pizza specifically and you're like, it's cake. This is cake. We right. eat cake for breakfast. We eat cake for dinner. We eat cake. The American cake. diet. The cake diet. We eat right. cake. Yeah, exactly. And it makes sense. It's white flour. Right. Pancakes. The morning is cake with cheese. That's the worst. Yes. Fried, fried cake for breakfast. Right? Fried cake. White. And then for lunch, what do they have? A pizza. That's cake with cheese on top. Yeah. And then for dinner, they have um, a quiche or some other cake. And then it's like, um, I don't know, p- pasta is cake. It's yeah. still white flour again. Right. White flour d- destroys your brain cells. It makes well, you that, less intelligent. It, takes but, away your, it makes you demented. That's it's actually... A, it's addictive. Uh, I've heard you say... Uh, that when people think they're hungry, I've said on this podcast many times, when people think they're craving meat, they're really craving fat. That's something that David Wolf said to me I thought was interesting. Because sometimes when I stopped eating meat, I would eat an avocado and I was like, oh, I just needed something kind of heavier, if that makes sense. Mm. You're shaking your head? Not really. Not really? See, I want to, you tell me what you think because you have an interesting idea on what people think hunger is. And you think it's actually something else. Yeah, absolutely. It's that... um, I've you know, tested and done studies to show that as people increase the nutritional quality of their diet, we're talking about micronutrients here, vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, antioxidants, do not contain calories. Mm-hmm. The American diet is ubiquitously deficient in micronutrients. These are micro- macronutrients are carbohydrates, protein, and, and fat. fat. Right. Carbo- and they have cal- calories. They have calories, right. And micro, or like taking a multivitamin, doesn't have any ca- calories, calories in it because it's just, just vitamins. Right, it's just the micronutrients without the calories. Right. 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 And so we, each strawberry has 700 micronutrients in it, phytochemicals and micronutrients. Each piece of broccoli has a thousand. Wow. So you can't get the micronutrients in, in the inside of a vitamin pill bottle. There's mm. the, we need the full spectrum of, of these phytochemicals that really prevent cancer. Okay. And I'm saying that as our diet is low in antioxidants and phytochemicals, and as we eat foods like pasta and bread and salad, salad oils and meats, the animal products and the chicken and the bagel doesn't have any micronutrients, antioxidants and phytochemicals. No significant micronutrient load, just a source of calories. And as you build up these calories without enough micronutrients, you also build up free radicals and other toxins like lipofusion and advanced glycation end products and other aldehydes and acids. This is what Joe in Fat Sick and Nearly Dead, he had a lot of free radicals, which turned into like a skin disorder. Well, that's the way he, uh, that's how he explained it. See, in I forget the movie, I'm talking the to cart- a doctor. If you weren't cartoon. a doctor, I would get away with that. <laughs> You'd be like, that's right, Peter. Way to pay attention during that cartoon part of a documentary. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I've been to medical school. <laughs> I, no, this is exciting. You keep, you keep me honest. That's good. But free radicals are bad. Free, yeah, free radicals, radicals lead to And disease. they're an example of toxins. And when you cook oil at high temperature, you produce a lot of free radicals, rancidity. So we're talking here about free radicals are produced in the body. Uh-huh. And other toxins are produced along with free radicals in the body. And most Americans are highly toxic. And when they, and these, the body does, enhances its repair, removes toxins, free radicals, and toxic waste products um, best when we're not eating food, in the non-feeding state. Mm -hmm. So we, like when you're smoking cigarettes, right? You feel this drive to eat, to smoke a cigarette again, because you stay away from cigarettes too long, you start to feel uncomfortable. But if you smoke a cigarette, you're going to feel better again. Right. You're drinking a cup of coffee, you may get a coffee headache when you stop, but if you want to feel better again, just drink another cup of coffee. When you're eating an unhealthy diet, you're going to feel ill when you stop eating the food and your digestion after about three or four hours where your stomach empties, your body goes into a heightened stage of self-cleansing, and the self-cleansing is a form of detoxification when you feel ill. The ill feeling is right-directed activity. It's repair going on that just feels too uncomfortable. Mm. People mistake that shakiness, that headache, that anxiety, that fatigue, the cramping, the stomach cramping and fluttering. They think that's hunger. And it's just withdrawal from their unhealthy diet. So people aren't feeling hungry. They're feeling withdrawal. They're feeling withdrawal. See, that I think is... And they feel better when they eat again. Right. Now, if they were eating healthy, they wouldn't feel those symptoms of withdrawal. They would feel true hunger. And they'd feel nothing until they were really hungry and if there was a biological need for calories again. So when there's no, so people are eating when there's no biological need for calories in response to their toxic hunger, the withdrawal from their unhealthy diet. Right. That has to, then people have to become overweight. There's no such thing as a normal weight person when, because no, they have no connection between their instinctual drive for hunger, their instinctual drive for calories. It's more like a drug addict. It's a drug addict. So and to feel okay, they have to overeat calories. Right. They must overconsume the calories, more calories than they need. In order to just to feel okay. I just have such a vivid memory of playing basketball as a kid and getting a direct order from my brain to be like, go eat ice cream right now. Like I just got like, right. I probably had ex- extended myself, got a little sweat going, and then I ran over to the ice cream truck and tried to find the most substantial thing they had, which was the ice cream sandwich with the two cookies. And I ate it and then I felt you know, the baby got his bottle again. Right. You're saying in a situation like that, I thought I was like, oh, I've been exercising and... and no, you're an addict. Yeah, I was an addict. Right, right. 
See, and, and we didn't know. No. Once you eat a diet with a high quality of nutrients and enough fiber, it shuts off the apostat. You feel nothing. Apostat. <laughs> I just love it. You feel nothing when you don't eat food. Yeah. You don't feel, and the hours go on, you don't feel anything until the point when your glycogen um, reserves are becoming exhausted. Mm. Now, then if you continue not to eat, because your body needs glycogen, and the brain can only run on glucose. Right. So if your glycogen reserves are exhausted, the brain cannot run on fat. It has to break down muscle tissue to make glucose. We can make mus- glucose from muscle tissue, not from fat. The body is too self-preserving and smart for that. It doesn't burn off muscle tissue needlessly. So it tells you to eat again to get more calories before it will start to eat up your muscle tissue. Hmm. That's called true hunger. Hmm. And that keeps you at a stable weight for the rest of you, all the time. It keeps you at that perfect weight. So you feel like you have a really clean connection between your brain and the part. It's all in your brain. But it tells and you the thing exactly, that wants you to eat. That's right. It tells you the correct amount to eat each day so you maintain your healthiest, most favorable weight for the rest of your We're life. We're all getting like AM radio that's like, I think I'm like, <laughs> you should maybe eat some pizza or something. And you're just like, something in you goes like, hey, Joel, eat a radish. <laughs> right? Well, it doesn't tell you what to eat, which is right. not because you hunger. Hunger is a throat sensation. Health, health in your neck See, I've heard you say that. So yeah. you're not feeling it where we think we feel no, it. You don't feel fatigue either. Fatigue is not hunger. That's because you're not on a healthy diet. You shouldn't feel fatigue. People need to keep their energy up. Yeah. That's not, they don't need to eat food to keep your energy up. Well, absolutely. Right. We're, we're five hour energy and then we're sleeping pills at night. We, we're yeah. this close to an on off switch. Like we just, we just want to right. feel how we want to feel when we want to feel it. But you're saying you can be far more stabilized. With all this negative stuff. Well, I'm saying you never have to be on a diet. You eat what you feel like eating. Your taste is enhanced when you're really hungry. And you don't want to, he said to me, hey, Joel, I'll walk in the apartment. You want this bowl of soup? You want something to eat? Nah. It looks like a nice bowl of soup, but I'll rather eat it later when I'm hungry when I'm going to enjoy it more because right. hunger enhance, enhance, gives you enhanced taste at the same time. You don't feel like eating when you're not hungry. It's, it it mm. really mm. feels like a type of abuse. As, as somebody who grew up yeah, it's, the, yes. the biggest kid in my class and all that stuff, I was like, why? I wish I had known. And I'm very excited that there's the internet and there are these documentaries and there are mm. podcasts like this. And, and now what I'm saying is the good news is you found – this sounds like an infomercial, but it, you have found with science – a, in my opinion, a very reasonable way around it, which doesn't involve deprivation or anything, anything like that. Like you're not uh, shaking. It's about giving yourself everything that you need so you feel great as opposed to the traditional model of a diet. Yeah, and most people following a nutritarian diet, eat what they, they eat what they want to eat. They just want the right stuff now. They you enjoy it more. It. Your taste buds get stronger. You like and you learn the recipes. And it's actually a myth to think that a person eating an unhealthy diet is enjoying their diet, their life, or their diet, or their food more than a person eating a healthy diet. That's just not true. G-bomb, your healthy life expectancy, H equals your N over C, nutrients over calories. In other words, you can predict your lifespan by your nutrient, um, micronutrient density of your diet. So it's calories. not about calories. It's about how – wait, you say don't count calories, make your calories count. Look, I'll do this for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, hmm. I'm hip to the people need to relax about protein game, but I feel like we could talk about that a little bit. Sure. You're actually a little bit concerned – maybe not concerned – informed that maybe – Yeah, it's a better word. Yeah, you're informed that people are eating too much protein. Well, animal protein in particular has yeah. effect to raise insulin-like, insulin-like growth factor 1, IGF-1. Mm-hmm. In other words, that the American population is poisoned by their excessive consumption of animal protein. Mm. And, and the reason we give credence to these studies, and how do we know who to believe? Some guy comes on a, on a podcast or on a television or on a, on, the, on a magazine article or the news, and he says, eat more meat. Butter is back. <laughs> it's the sugar killing you, not the meat. You know, right. they, or get you know, Atkins, Zucan, Paleo. Boo boo diet, whatever it is. You know? <laughs> the boo boo diet. <laughs> the boo-boo diet. <laughs> the yogi and boo boo. Yeah, 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 the yogi and boo boo. It's where you only eat small bears <laughs> oh, in picnic baskets. <laughs> I got the it. Mag- anyway, the, <laughs> <laughs> the point is, is that we give more credence to studies that follow people for decades 10, 20, 30 years, large numbers of people looking at hard endpoints. Like I the China you- study. Yeah, well, or the, there's a lot of studies. Like, you know, I can give you a Twinkie diet, and it might look better in a year because you got sick of eating Twinkies. You cut your calories back, and you lost weight. But <laughs> over the 10-year, 20-year period, you're going to die of cancer with eating a Twinkie diet, even though your weight is better. Right. The point is here is that a study published, let's say, in British Medical Journal in 2012 following 6,000 people between the ages of 50 and 65 followed them for 18 years, that those that had higher amounts of animal protein – had a four-fold increased risk of cancer, 400% increased risk of cancer, and a 75% increase of total death over that 18-year period in the higher protein group compared to the low, protein, low animal protein group. Mm-hmm. The lower animal protein group was less than 10% of animal product, which is less than 7.5% animal protein, 
the higher group was 30% or animal product, which is, like, which is less than what Americans eat. Mm-hmm. And you have these... these um, we know, eat like 60%. Trainer, you know, these trainers and paleo people advocating people eat 50 to 60% of calories. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When we know that when you move from 10% to 30%, cancer rates go up fourfold. Mm-hmm. That's one study. Why believe one study? Mm-hmm. Let's pick more, more studies. Look at the studies. What, which studies we give more credence to? The answer is the ones that have large numbers of people that go on for many decades and use hard endpoints, like death, right? <laughs> that's a hard death. That's a hard yeah, endpoint. That's a hard one, right? yeah. Study on 129,000 people. Well, yeah, the 129,000 people study showed that people had a 43% increased risk of death with higher amounts of animal products compared to lower amounts. Let's look at the study on, the, on the 40, 49,000 women who were studied cardiovascular deaths. They rated these women's diet. We're talking about 40, over 30,000, 40,000 women here. Mm-hmm. They rated their diets based on, on 1 to 20. They got a score of 1 to 20. 1 was like a vegan or mostly vegetables. 20 was Atkins type, like totally mm-hmm. ketogenic, pro- high protein, low vegetable consumption. The whole di- all the study people they studied were not eating much sugar in their diet. Mm-hmm. Low sugar, low processed foods diets, just looking at the otherwise the same. Because the only difference was the animal product consumption was different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, they, and the amount of animal products got a score of 1 to 20. And they found that as you went up from one, two, three, four, five, every score going up, you, the risk of death went up 2% for every point going up. And the people above 16 had a 60% increased risk of cardiovascular death, not even cancer death, hmm. compared to those below six. See, when, so we're showing here that what I'm saying is that <laughs> yes, please, not controversial. It's completely irresponsible to advocate people eat high amounts of animal products. We could talk about what, ex- what lower amounts are acceptable. We could say, where is the gray area of discussion here? But the idea that animal products are favorable, it has to be, we have, Americans as a, as a whole have to tremendously cut back on the amount of animal proteins they mm. eat because we even know the mechanisms involved, we, which the hormonal effects from eating so much animal protein, why they raise the hormones, how it has the effects, it's all explainable. You know, and we know how it works. We have the, and we have the data. It's, 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 it's established science by now. It's funny that you say the studies that we favor. You're speaking as a scientist. I'm speaking... <laughs> As as a regular person, I'm like, typically the the studies that we favor are the ones that say go eat more meat. Like we love those studies. Right. Like I remember, and the you first can make time- a study do anything you want. The egg company can show a study. They can pull out. They can say, okay, look, it didn't matter if people ate more or less eggs here. We can you know we can compare eggs to put donuts in. Them, put you know in other words, right. um, The studies on saturated fat, butter is back, is all about putting people on more high glycemic carbohydrates and taking out the fats. And high glycemic carbohydrates are worse than the fats, but it doesn't make the fats good because your high glycemic carbohydrates are worse. It didn't exonerate the saturated fat. Right. The eggs aren't. Ex- it's they just the lesser two evil. That's right. So one, you don't buy a car by comparing it to a junkyard wreck. The point <laughs> is, is that it didn't make another thing good because the other thing was bad. Well, Even you know. So we're talking here about we really have to compare. Look at what's the best way to eat. Well, when I watch uh, your PBS talks and stuff, I get this overwhelming and I try not to do this because I I don't think I have a savior complex, but I do like to proselytize and I tell people what's really exciting to me. And that's why I'm having you on the podcast. They can listen or not. But now that we have them... (laughs) I have so many friends on the paleo diet. I, I will say, I take issue with the idea that it's eating like a caveman because no caveman killed seven ducks, two pigs, and a, and a cow in one day. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, there's so much meat going on. But then when I hear you saying that it's 400% more likely to get cancer when you're eating right. all those animal products, That's right. I, I feel like I have to tell them. Like, I, I want them. <laughs> That's why I'm having you on the show. Right. It's, it's almost it's ill will not to say something. That's what, it's, it's, you're, you're making yourself more comfortable. Right. But it's not goodwill to be comfortable. Right. It's goodwill to be uncomfortable because maybe you're going to help their life. Even if they don't do it, at least you had, gave them the opportunity. At least to, you gave them the agency. You're right. You're like, now you're doing it. Yeah. Let's look in, at some of the in, data in here and just way. do this in looking at some of this data because there's lots of studies that show that this could be dangerous. Right. And what about salt? Because I hear you talk about salt being bad. Yes, and I then do. I'm like, I, I think one of the health trends is we go like, but pink Himalayan salt's okay. Is that, <laughs> or, or like liquid aminos, is anything salty going to be bad in the end? I heard when, um, when they went to the moon, they took some salt off the backside of the moon, and that salt's good. <laughs> oh, the Pink Floyd salt? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sodium is sodium. The idea that like, some salts have more, that's the most ridiculous thing in the alternative medicine community. Mm-hmm. Salt is 2,000 milligrams of sodium per teaspoon, right? So mm-hmm. it's 2,000 milligrams of sodium. You, you have um, the little bit of minerals that you have in some of these natural salts. Magnesium and whatnot. The amount of minerals is microscopic. It's not as much minerals as one bite of vegetables. Hmm. You know, we're talking about the amount of minerals plays no effect on your So health. this is like a play by big salt to say like, hey, take some uh, pink salt before bed. It'll help you sleep. Uh, so I think it's an, a scam of the alternative medicine community trying to get people. But in any case, salt causes microvascular hemorrhaging. That means the, into the endothelium, the inner walls of your blood vessels are inflamed from salt, chronically mm. inflamed. Mm. 
weakening the blood vessel lining, increasing the risk of um, having a clot or having a break in the blood vessels causing a hemorrhagic stroke over the years. It damages you, puts you, and, and takes its toll the years and years of the high-salt diet, weakens your blood vessels eventually, and you want a leading cause of death. Hmm. For people, so the, uh, if you ate foods without salt in them, you'd be still consuming salt because all natural foods contain sodium. That's right. what humans did for millenniums, for 30, for 50,000 years. We ate the salt that was in the food. Right. But now we add salt on top of that. And how much salt could we add that would be acceptable? And it looks like you know, if we added you know, 200 to 400 a day over and above what the food had, it would still be under 1,000, 1,200 for a male, 1,000 for a female, probably okay. But 200, pe- 400 milligrams? Grams of sodium over and above what's in the natural food. Then your total for the day would still be under 1,000. Right. But it looks as if, though, that the Americans consuming about 3,000, you know, some of the Asian countries consuming more than 4,000, and we see as salt intake goes up, so does stomach cancer, hemorrhagic stroke, overall strokes, you know, a lot of... So, so, so you can't justify <laughs> any kind of natural sodium. It's, it takes salt to salt. Salt is salt. I remember, uh, and I don't want to cause a flutter in the alternative medicine community, but David Wolf puts salt in his water. He says your body's more like an ocean than it is a river, and you need to, like, balance it out by taking in these quote-unquote good salts or whatever. I remember hearing him say that and being like, oh, i got to put salt in my water, and I did. He was like, it helps you absorb water better or something like that. There's a lot of nonsense out there. In the, <laughs> you know, and, you know, who do you – do you pick a nutritional guru? Yeah. Or, and do you like the guy's mustache? <laughs> This is why I love you. You're saying look at the data. Oh, you look at the data. Yeah, look at the data. data. How much much studies have you looked on this subject? And if there's data not there, then have an open mind to where maybe maybe you have a little flexibility here. You don't know. You have to say I don't know. Right. But there's certain things we know because we have an overwhelming amount of data about it. Okay. Salt. (laughs) So when you eat a healthy diet and you don't overeat salt, your kidneys get more effective at holding on to it. You don't excrete as much salt in your urine. Hmm. And over the time of being on a low-salt diet, your sweat becomes less lower levels of sodium when you sweat. So now when you're out there running marathons or exercising or playing basketball or tennis, you're not depleting yourself of sodium because your sweat is, is, doesn't have sodium in it because your diet's – it's your, your body's – kidneys u- are better. Your kidneys are holding on to it. Your sweat's holding on to it. Your body is used to a low-sodium diet. When hmm. you're used to a high-sodium diet, your, your sweat's putting out sodium. Your urine's putting out lots of sodium all the time. Then when you go exercise, you excrete more sodium. Your sodium goes up and down more. It's not as stable. Hmm. When you overdrink water, you wash away sodium. So the overconsumption of water – this is why some people who, run, who are heavy runners can – overhydrate and have a seizure hmm. because their levels of sodium gets too low. It's not that they had no sodium. It's they overdrank water and you pee out too much electrolytes. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Can you, what do you think about alcohol? Well, I, I'm always looking for a doctor to just be like, Pete, this is what it's doing. It's why you shouldn't drink it. So maybe you can be that guy. Well, or, I, I don't really, you know, I try as much as possible not to have personal opinions just to tell people sure. what the science shows. It's what car- does the science show? It's carcinogenic. Okay. So it's like smoking. Well, it's, it's smoking effects is maybe, well, well I, there's, Women who drink, for example, one glass of wine a day have a 12%, on the average, a 12% increased risk of breast cancer. Really? Men who drink two glasses or more have higher rates of throat cancer, stomach cancer, squamous cell cancer of the, epith- of the um, digestive tract. Mm. In other words, it mostly increases cancer in the, in the areas that it touches going down. Hmm. You know, men can tolerate alcohol a little better. Um, people think it thins the blood. But if you're on a very unhealthy diet, the slight blood thinning effect like aspirin can decrease the clotting, having a heart attack. So it's maybe some heart benefits there. But at the same time, it's increasing risk of hemorrhagic stroke because it's thinning the blood and you can bleed to death. Hmm. So, there's, so, there's, so alcohol is really, you can't, you know, so some people have been mistakenly thinking, oh, it's good for the heart and it's advertised and it have some benefits. Uh, it may, it's, it's, carcinog- it's mildly carcinogenic. Mm-hmm. It's not something people should do for their health. They should eat right to protect their heart, not drink alcohol to protect their heart. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about coffee? I think it's okay in moderate amounts. It's, of course, unless, unless they're sweetening it. Yeah. You know, but, it, but of course, in, or at least keeping you up at night or it's making you not sleep as well or you're addicted to it and you're, because of the addictive withdrawal of the headaches or the buzz you get from coming off coffee, it's making you eat more food because eating food can, can lessen the headache from coffee. Interesting. So it could be a, a trigger to eat more calories. As long as you're slim and it's not a trigger to eat more calories, and as long as you're eating it in the morning and, not, and you're not going to have an, a lot that's going to affect you when you're sleeping at night, and you're not, you know, so, so in moderate amounts, it's favorable. And for Americans, they, eat no be- they don't eat enough black and dark beans and other types of um, those kind of flavanols and black beans and blackberries and blueberries, right? So then the coffee bean becomes a bean they're eating, and they get some polyphenols that benefit them to, mm. so to a degree. Okay. But it wouldn't really benefit. You didn't have to drink coffee for those polyphenols. You could just eat other, other foods that, are, that have those polyphenols in them. Right. But so there's some, there's some you know, <laughs> silver lining to the coffee, so to speak. 
and the caffeine would be the negative part, but there's some beneficial parts, especially for people who are not regularly eating the beans and dark polyphenol foods. Okay. And then I was surprised. I only asked you one question because I didn't want to bother you when I met you in Hawaii. But we, I, we were talking about being raw. And at the time, I really like I do. I still like eating a lot of raw food. Mm-hmm. And I was hosting a talk show, and that was really good for my energy. I never really felt bogged down, so I ate a lot of raw stuff. Right. But then you were like, you should cook your mushrooms. You were like, yeah, yes. that is better to eat a cooked mushroom than a raw. Mushroom. Right. You remember that, right? Because it's better to eat the green vegetables and the onions raw because there's an enzyme called myrosinase in the green vegetable. It's heat sensitive, and then the onion has its alienase. It's heat sensitive, and we deactivate those enzymes with cooking. Then when you're chewing or blending or eating those foods, you're not forming as many of the anti-cancer compounds. Hmm. So the certain foods benefit by more. But mushrooms, very rich in anti-cancer compounds, longevity promoting compounds. It's like a, a, aromatase inhibitors in mushrooms and angiogenesis inhibitors in mushrooms, which prevent cancer and from, prevent fat cells from growing on your body. Hmm. But there's also a mild carcinogen in mushrooms called agaritine. And when you heat up a mushroom, even steam it or walk it for even two minutes, it blows off into the air. Hmm. And, the, and the beneficial compounds aren't destroyed with cooking in a mushroom, like they would be in the green vegetable. So yes, it's better to eat most of your mushrooms cooked, not raw. Mm-hmm. And I remember I also said, I was like, how do you cook that? Like basic, like if people are listening and they want to dabble in it, something that you taught me, it seems so basic, was to cook the mushrooms just in like vegetable stock. Because my first thought was, you're going to cook mushrooms, you're going to use coconut oil or something. You think it's like a healthy oil or olive oil, people, these are healthy oils. You were like, no, just maybe a little veggie stock. You were just talking about that recipe where you're cooking in water. That, that I think, is news to people. Like, what, what are some things that... Like, you, you take, a, take a wok, put it on the stove, put a quarter cup of water in there, throw you a whole bunch of broccoli, water chestnuts, snow pea pods, chopped up onions and mushrooms and shredded cabbage and dump it in there, right? Mm-hmm. Let, let that cook for five minutes, stir it around a little bit. Well, at the same time, you do that. Make a sauce for it. Make a nice sauce. Let it start cooking in the water while you're making a nice sauce. Mm-hmm. Throw it into your blender, maybe a peanut butter, some hemp seeds, a date, maybe, so, maybe a squeeze of lemongrass paste in there to give it like a Thai flavoring, <laughs> maybe a little cumin or a little bit turmeric for anti-cancer effects and like a little spice. Put that in a blender. But you can put a little almond milk in there to get a little the thickness you want. Whip it up. Your sauce is done. Pour that onto the right out of the blender, right onto the cooking vegetables now. <laughs> it's ready to go. And just walk it for another two minutes. You've got a great Thai I vegetable dish. I just love how excited right. you are. Right. Nobody cares about what they're doing. You really care about it, and you make people excited about it. Like yeah. you just made me excited about a vegetable stir fry. No big deal, right? When yeah. yes, no big deal. But most people, like you know, my in laws are not vegan. For example, they come over our house. We try and cook them like a vegan meal and be like, "This is vegan," and it just doesn't compute as a meal unless there was. Like the idea of just having soup for a meal is preposterous mm-hmm. to a lot of people that I know and love. But the beans give you that help, that hefty kind of feel to the meal. Without the beans, they're just the vegetables are too light, the calories. I completely you know, agree. Beans and nuts add that hefty feel. Ooh, Cialis. You didn't mention dick pills in your, in your things that people are prescribed. Mm-hmm. I mean, that has to be a canary in the coal mine if you're having problems in that area, wouldn't you say? Well, I would say this, that most men develop problems in those areas because of circulatory problems, because mm-hmm. of diabetes, because mm-hmm. of their cruddy diet. So they age prematurely, and they don't just get problems with their erections. They get problems with their back pain. They get problems with the circulation of their joints. They get problems with their hips and their knees, and their whole body falls apart. It's not just the one part of the body falls apart. It's represented for their whole body falling apart. <laughs> I knew you'd have a good one for that. <laughs> so this is just another hammer hand situation where they're like, That's correct. my penis stopped working. And they're like, well, right. take this one. Really, you should fucking cool it on... The you garbage should, you're eating. If they had a, they write this. They would age slower. They maintain their youthful vigor, their mental faculties, and their physical faculties, and their sexual ability. All these things would stay lasting longer, and they wouldn't even be drug dependent and having to pay you all this money. What is the because you make so much sense, and I enjoy you so much. I wonder what you run into the most as people that it might be critical of this. It does seem a little extreme. I love it, mm-hmm. but people listening might be like, "I'm not just going to eat." Stir fry th- three meals a day, or or well, steel cut. Out. Eat, they, you know, I know yeah. there's variety. Can, yeah, there's a tremendous <laughs> variety, and, and certainly this is a fun way to eat. And they should learn more about it. So yeah, yeah so I don't think that. The, um, but what is the big thing that people, other other physicians maybe that, that say why why aren't what you're saying makes so much sense? Is it just a matter of time for this to spread? Well, or well, I don't know, but I mean, <laughs> most people aren't going to eat this way. Yeah, they're too addicted, and the people that need it the most are the ones that are most likely not to do it because mm. they're so addicted they don't even want to look at it mm-hmm. or consider it. Mm. But you know, most of my career as a physician and, and and as a training to become a physician, most of the response I had from like in medical school when I was talking about stuff like this, mm-hmm. the same response you get today is people say, 
oh, yeah, we know that makes sense and we know it, it works most likely, but people aren't going to want to change their diet, so I'm just going to give them a pill anyway. It's going to take me too long to explain it, and if I explain it, they're not going to do it anyway. Right. So I'm just saying I can't possibly keep the patients, um, keep it, you know, see enough patients. I'm not going to waste my time and then I talk for hours and they're not going to even listen to me. Right. So it's a waste of my time. It's just much easier to write a pill, and you're not going to make a, and they used to always say, you're not going to make a living that way. Mm. You're not going to make money. You're going to be too much, too much time and not going to change a lot of people's minds. They're not going to change the way they eat. They're, they just want a simple, people want a simple solution. It's they want, too many people, too. It's too right. many people to explain this to if right. you're a doctor doing right. your rounds. You, you can't do this can't, spiel right. 300 times. Right, but now we have a growing, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is a, gro- a growing medical specialty. i give you an example. A guy, he's the head of invasive um, interventional cardiology. Interventional cardiology, the people that put the stents in. And mm-hmm. here I'm telling him how bad it is to put a stent in, right? Mm-hmm. So he gets up in front of a medical conference with all these doctors, and he says, three people affected my life the most. My mother, my father, and Dr. Furman. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And he says, and I'm not stenting people anymore. I'm teaching them about nutrition. Wow. Because I work for the VA, and I don't get more money anyway if they so I put a stent in, based on how productive I'm putting stents in. I make money. I want to keep these people healthy. Yeah, he has I'm no now, incentive. That's no great. incentive, and I have been people are getting much better results changing the way they eat. And if I could tell them with strength that they got to just smack their head against the wall and say you're committing suicide with food, you got to make these changes, and not put a stent's not going to help you. You're going to, you got to really get, turn your health around, and it works. People do it. We want people to eat cooked beans their diet, very protective against longevity, all blue zones, people, all people, um, groups What's of blue people. Zone? Blue zones are areas around the world where you have the most centenarians, most people living in over 100. Uh-huh. And all the blue zones. Centenarians. Zo- you have a lot of fun terms. <laughs> I didn't invent that word. No, I know. I don't think you invited the, <laughs> the only one either, but they're great. <laughs> they're fun. <laughs> the only word I coined was nutritarian. Yeah, there you go. And that's a good one. That's a great word, right? I like that it's just so indifferent. Like, if, if you read data that said we should all be eating a cow head and it needs to be freshly killed in front of us, you'd be like, well, that's what we should be eating. Right. Whereas, I, you know, I, I, like a lot of vegans, you know, became vegan and then started looking into the morality because it was more comfortable for me. Right. You're just doing, like, what should human beings be eating? <laughs> just what, that's what I've been looking for my entire life. Just fucking tell me what to eat. And you're like, eat some red peppers, you idiot. <laughs> Right. The, the fact that I get letters and emails every day of people who have changed their life, saved their life, reversed their heart disease, got rid of their psoriasis, got rid of their asthma, got rid of their migraines, people who are literally in bed, who had no life, back to having a full life again. It's just been so exciting. I feel so um, lucky and yeah. rewarded and humbled, the fact that I've affected so many people's lives having this opportunity. I didn't think when I became a doctor I'd have so many people, the ability to affect so many people's lives. You right. know what I mean? Well, that's the story of when you met your wife. You, you, you look down your nose at doctors. They just prescribe bullshit and they they're just kind of a cog in the system and you went outside again this is not to butter your bread too much but this is why you're exciting you stepped outside and succeeded like you broke away from the pack you're not the other thing i like is you're not telling anybody anything that doesn't make intuitive sense eating living colorful things as opposed to things that are packaged red and yellow and you know there's some blue because they know that our brains are you know evolutionarily wired to desire those types of things those colors those flavors you're just saying like go back and eat that stuff (laughs) right and And a lot of it right and so we don't have to cut we don't eat thimble sized portions of food yeah we can eat liberally as much as we want when we eat the right foods and we're going to want the right amount yeah so it's not that difficult it's not uncomfortable, and eventually you begin, you, you begin to prefer this way of eating. It begins, it be not, you're not on a diet. It's the way you prefer to eat for mm-hmm. lots of reasons. Mm-hmm. You enjoy it more. You like the way you feel good. You like the way it affects you intellectually. It affects you emotionally. You feel good about yourself. You enjoy your life. You feel protected. Mm-hmm. It's just a, so a lot of people are embracing this idea so, so of eating a nutritarian diet. I, one of the jokes I love is you say, this, could, this diet couldn't have been made better if it was done by Al-Qaeda. Right. Like it's yeah. the most destructive inside right. sort of terrorist activity that's yeah, happening. So we, have, we have a perfect diet to, designed to kill people and to keep them in a really in a, in a tragic state. Right. Because we mix together the high glycemic carbohydrates like white bread, like a hamburger bun, with a hamburger. Mm. And when you mix those two things... It's two- in the title of the bun. Yeah, right. <laughs> you got to get the hamburger. That's why they named the bun. <laughs> <laughs> Macaroni and cheese, yeah. you know, hamburgers. But the point is, is when you mix together the high glycemic carbohydrate with the concentrated animal protein, you raise both insulin and IGF-1. The carbohydrate raises the insulin. The meat raises the IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1. And that, that combination, that particular sandwich of carb- hormones produces ca- a cancer. You know, mm. pro- promotes breast cancer the most. But it doesn't just promote breast cancer. It promotes aging of the brain, aging of your body, destruction of your joints. We're talking here about you know, a health care crisis in this country. 
and of course, you know, in the modern world, cancer is a new phenomenon, never occurred in human history. Scrotal cancer was first developed in chimney sweeps in the mid-17th century. Hmm. We're talking about something that really, we don't ever had breast cancer. Countries have one-fiftieth the breast cancer. I haven't heard that. Cancer country. is like a relative, breast Re- cancer is like a relatively new thing? Absolutely new thing. We did autopsies on like um, female people from the pyramids where they were in the, in the corpses that were in, um, the bodies were preserved. Yeah, you know sure. I mean? No, we didn't see any breast cancer at all in women. And, and they said, well, that's because they didn't live long. No, no, no. We, have, we can test how long they lived and we could see that even in people that lived longer, we didn't right. see these cancers. We can read the hieroglyphics. There's 38 yeah. hawks here. She was 38. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's but very the, tragic. But the point is, is that cancer, that we know through the history of literature and of medical literature, that cancer is a recent phenomenon. That's, I've, yeah. I had, this is a free podcast. I don't know if you know, you're dropping some bombs. <laughs> Nutritional science has made such incredible advances in the last 20 years that we have the power so our population never has to have heart attacks and strokes and get demented, and we can wipe out 90% of the cancer. We don't have to invent this magic pill. This is a stu- the craziest thing in the world. We're going to invent this magic pill from the drug company. Right. People can smoke cigarettes for 30 years, three packs a day, take a pill and not get lung cancer. Right. We're going to eat American food and not get breast cancer or prostate cancer with a magic pill. It's not going to work. We have the answers right now. Yeah. The answer right now is in your, is in your kitchen. Right. And right in your, in, in your own control. See, again, this is why I think mm-hmm. I get really excited when I, when I listen to you talk, is you're in the freedom business. I like anybody that's, right. that's liberating people. Right. You don't want to do it, don't do it. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. I don't care if you don't do it. Yeah, you whatever you want. I'd be in medical school. I'd be walking in my class, you know, in the, <laughs> in the path where they go to my seat, and people would be hiding their candy bars. <laughs> And I'd go, I'm not your mother. Be whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, but you're saying like – you're saying that you're being sold a bill of goods. When people are with advertising and all – you talk about the sugar and the salt that you don't even taste that they put into fast they're, food. Yeah, and they're addicting too. It's not even to make you taste it. I get that fat and salt taste good and sugar tastes good. But injecting it into the inside of a French fry That's or in the batter – They inject into the French fry batter. They put the sugar and salt and the MSG in the meat. In the meat just meat. for your brain. Just so it makes you get more thirsty, drink more soda, eat more food. The more you salt, put salt and oil and sugar in a food, the more people can increase their caloric intake. And oil comes in free. Right. You mean oil doesn't shut off the apostat. In other words, if I gave you 200 calories of walnuts, you'd eat 200 calories less at the lunch because the walnuts would shut off your apostat. It'd stop you from taking in those calories. Apostat? Like thermostat? Yeah, like a thermostat. I love right? it. So if, you, if I put 200 calories of walnut oil because there's no fiber associated with it, yeah. You wouldn't sense you're eating it because no way the body can sense how much calories. The body doesn't sense calories as much as it right. the bulk of the food and the fiber. I've seen that image yeah. of a stomach and it fills up with 300 calories right. of that's oil. That's why I made that image. That's you! When you eat a lot of lettuce or whatever it might be, like you eat a big salad, your stomach gets, what is it, the apa? The apostat? Apostat. How did I forget? Yeah. It's so fun. Yeah. The apostat gets triggered because your stomach is full, but you can eat a, lot, a fuck ton of oil, you can swear on this podcast, <laughs> without feeling full. So you put out the oil, the oil and the bread before the meal. People are sopping up. Right. You're sopping up free calories because you don't sense it. You, need, you need just eat just as many calories in the meal. But oil, as opposed to eating whole foods, makes you eat more calories. So it's not just the extra calories you took from the oil, but right. adding salt and oil and sugar to the food makes you even want to eat more calories than you need. And more calories than you need, of course, shortens your lifespan. This is insane. Yeah. This is insane. Well, that's why I think about in terms of freedom. These people, are, food companies are figuring out what your brain wants and ways to trick your brain into eating things and, and they're just trying to sell more product. It's not really – like you're bad for business. Like what you preach is bad for business. And I'm bad for the drug companies and all the – and the restaurant business and everybody hates me. That's why I have a, a bodyguard with a bulletproof – that's why I have a bulletproof vest and a bodyguard. That is not true. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, going back to the freedom of it and, and the – people think that – Eating whatever we want. Like, I, I've talked to people about nutrition before. Right. I can be annoying in that way. And my friend, or, you know, I'm trying to help or whatever it is. And my friends are like, I'd rather live shorter and eat whatever I want. I'm sure, sure this is something that people say to you. Sure, that's what to people who are delusional and, <laughs> and um, you know, people who. Tell me what you mean. I know what you mean, but tell me. Well, it's that, it's like when you, food is very addicting, and, um, and people who are, you know, who are self delusional. And um, illogical or come up with irrational excuses why they continue to smoke cigarettes, snort cocaine, or do whatever they want to do. You're saying it's the same thing. You're saying these people are 
addicted to these things, the dopamine associated dopamine with Dopamine in the brain is the same as narcotics. Yep. And it takes away part of their conscious brain. So, so they, their addictions are talking because your primitive brain wants to protect your addictions. So you come up with these you know, delusional excuses why you can still smoke cigarettes. Like, my, well, my, well, maybe when I'm pregnant, I'll stop. Or well, you know, right now, I have too much stress in my life. As if smoking cigarettes, snorting cocaine, or eating junk food lowers your stress. It takes away your ability to make choices in life because it, ta- it makes you stupider. Is that right? Yes. Like when you eat processed foods and sugar and honey and maple syrup and, and French fries, when you eat those foods, it destroys brain cells like alcohol does. So it's making you dumber. And it's making you de- – it takes a, a cloud over your life like a fog. It makes you more depressed. Mm. makes you unable to make good choices in life. It makes you make bad decisions. And you're unable to succeed at your career. So it, it, it puts a level of um, – it lowers the level of ability and achievement in your life. It lowers the ability to be happy. And then you're saying, well, I've got to keep doing it though. I've got to keep doing it because I'm, right. like, I'm going to live a better life. And you're, and you're, lost, you're no longer in control of your life. Your addiction is in control of your life. Your decisions are made by your addictions, tr- craving those foods, having to eat those <laughs> things. And then, you're, and then you're ill all the time. And then you get to be older. And then- and you have really you're, ill. you're really ill. You're dependent on physicians. You have joint pain, hip replacement, back hurts. Your kidneys are going bad. You're taking medications. Your life revolves around your medical problems, right. and you think you had a better life. And they and they don't even know that they would have liked the food, the taste of the healthy food better anyway, because right. that's another ridiculous. Well, it was never offered to us, was it? Yeah, they didn't even know that they could make the healthy foods taste good, and they didn't train their taste buds. In other words, when your taste buds are deadened by the high sugar, high salt, highly 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 palatable diet, you don't enjoy the flavor in a strawberry. Yeah. You know, I can give you, what do you want to eat, apple pie a la mode? I can give you a healthy apple pie a la mode that tastes just as good, but you've got to get used to eating this way for you to really appreciate right. the taste as much, and I want to appreciate the taste. And you said that takes a couple of weeks just to kind of flesh it out, or, or is it No, not it takes really? more than that. It takes more than that? Well, I th- all through my career as a physician, I thought it took like three months to get your taste buds to really come back fully, uh-huh. but I actually did a study and published it in the nutrition journal where we tested it on people, and to see, well, how much time did it take them to like this way of eating more than their old diet? And for a large number of people, it took six months, actually. Is that right? Even three months, their taste See, didn't even come back yet. This is why I wanted to have you on, is you're talking about, you're just looking at science. You seem like a guy that goes like, I don't have an agenda in this way. I'm not being paid That's That's by right. the vegetable people. That's right. I, I don't want to have, I feel it, that it's my duty as a nutritional scientist and as a physician specializing in nutrition not to have a predetermined bias. Not mm-hmm. to have any other agendas. I mean, sure, eating less animal products and less meat will be good for the environment. Right. But, but I'm not a climate scientist. Mm-hmm. It'll be good for it's as ethical reasons, but I'm not an ethicist. I'm not a, you know, in other words, I stick to what I do best. You're sticking to one sticking area. To getting the nutrition, knowing, being familiar with all the science, and giving people the science that's unaffected by any other factors. And they can, do it, they can use this to, get, to know they have unbiased information to make choices they want to make. Mm-hmm. That they can make the best choice for their life. Have you heard anything about the stress... <laughs> Some of my friends that love to eat, you know, myself included, you want to cheat or stray, they'll sometimes quote, I don't even, I haven't even seen the study. They're like, they said that the stress associated with denying yourself the foods that you want is also really bad for you. <laughs> Have you ever heard that? I don't know if there may be something like it, but it's, you know, that's, no, it's, to- that's totally ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> snort cocaine. I'm going to snort cocaine. That's good for me because the stress of denying me cocaine is going to not be good for my health. That's a really good one. You know. Well, see, going back you know, to this, that just ahead. shows people people don't know that the white bread with salt and sodium bromate in it is because a class two carcinogen. Mm. These are carcinogenic foods that cause diabetes and dementia, and they're addictive. And they don't denying yourself things that are, are dangerous for you is not um, is is called. Good sense, yeah, and sensible. I heard, I heard you, you know. say something interesting that, like, statistically speaking, lifespan appeared to be shorter, you know, centuries ago. But it was because so many women were dying in childbirth, and so many children were dying uh, yes. early on as well. That's right. So high kind infant of mortality, high childhood mortality, high childbirth mortality. One in nine women die giving childbirth. But if we look at, for example, in the 14th, 13th, and 14th centuries. Take males, take the males who are Renaissance artists who produce works of art. Mm-hmm. They had longer lifespan than the average male today in this country has. Mm. Because so, so the idea that we're living longer than ever before is, yeah, we are, but adults aren't living longer. Adult males aren't living longer. True. 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 This is what I love about this message. It's not about shaming people for wanting to drink yes, soda. <laughs> 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 what I, well, we can shame if we'd like. But what I'm saying is it's more you're saying you, like you got pulled – pulled into something that you didn't understand. Right. Like you got tricked. That's yes. why I like, I yeah. think you're in the freedom business. People are drinking soda, eating cake, all that stuff because we think it's normal. And you're saying it doesn't have to be that way. And that, so tell, tell, tell the good, hi Brody, tell the people what a nutritarian is basically. Well, the word nutritarian is a word I coined. That means a person who 
um, is eating very healthfully and eating and trying to get a sufficient nutrients in their diet. And um, there could be people that are philosophical nutritarians. They, a new philosophical nutritarian is a person that understands that they're in control of their health and the quality of they live, that they live their life and how healthy they eat affects their long-term health later on in life. You know? Right. And so when it's about longevity, it's about health, it's about not getting a stroke, not getting a heart attack, right. it's reversing you be, diabetes you or something. Being, you being in control of right. your life, not having it be luck right, or even genetics. Well, that, that's one of the crazy things that we all do is we all walk around going like – and I do this. I'm like, is today the day that I feel some weird pain and I go to somebody like you and you're like, sorry. Yeah. Like, we go to, do- we go to and, hospitals. And fear. And that, that fear, living yeah. with fear of getting cancer every minute. Can't walk, walk one to a bus. You're going to have a heart attack. Yeah. You get any, any time over the age of 60. I want to be doing moguls and, you know, and yeah. playing volleyball on the beach and sprinting and racing my kids and see who could run faster. And, and, you <laughs> and know, still and, winning, damn it. Yeah, exactly. You know, well, I be, feel like we go to... To, You want to live longer and do all the things you did in your 50s, 60s, 70s, and yeah. 80s, and you're, you're in your 20s. You know, why should you change? Why should your life not get the full And you're saying it doesn't have to. I get the feeling when I go to the doctor, if I have some weird thing that I, they want them to check out, you have your freedom pass, and then you go into the, do- into the hospital, and you're like, are you going to renew my freedom pass? Like, can I leave and continue behaving exactly the same way? You talk about it like hitting your hand with a hammer right. and then going to the doctor. You, you tell it. It's your right. thing. It's better. And also, I'm, the point I was making right now is fear is bad for your health. Yeah. And going for these medical tests, yes. constant fear of disease. When you eat healthy, you have the fear of disease on you, in you all the time. When you eat healthy, you have freedom of fear. And it not only makes your brain um, – makes you so you have your full brain faculties as you age, yeah. but it means that you're aging in with joy. That's you know? what I'm saying. That's why yeah. I'm having you on. Yeah. This isn't about fat shaming or anything. This is about life living and right. joy having. And that's why I get very excited right. talking to you now. And I was saying you hit your hand with a hammer. I mean, yeah. It's like going to a doctor. You, you, you say you, want, you hit your hand with a hammer every day. You go to a doctor. gives you a pill to take away your pain. You go back home and hit your hand with a hammer again. Right. You know, you're looking for drug-seeking behavior. Right. You, know, as you go into doctors and whose who's, um, toolbox – are, dr- are drugs. Right. You can't get health from drugs. Right. You can't buy your health in a bottle. Right. You have to earn it. Drugs have nothing to do with your health. Right. You know? And you, you've even said that the, the health industry can even be downright harmful. It's just the way that it's been set up. I said it a little more um, adamant than that. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> well, please. I'm saying here that this sounds quite radical, but I think I have the science to support it. I love it. That, that what the medical profession mostly does is not just worthless. <laughs> because worthless means not good or not bad. It just means nothing. It's neutral. Neutral. <laughs> Cumulatively, it's worse than worthless. <laughs> because when you're treating people with blood pressure, when the number one drugs are blood pressure medications, diabetic medications, anxiety medications, antidepressants, and, and um, cholesterol drugs, these drugs who's are, who, where the person has the high blood pressure, has the anxiety, has the depression, has the high cholesterol because of what they're eating, mm-hmm. and you don't give them the opportunity that they could have gotten well, and you just have a drug that's going to cause more further serious problems like cancer, right. or keep them, you know, then you've, then you've sold that person out, and you've given them, dr- you've added the toxic drug. It's not like a person with a hammer now who smacked their hand is just getting a pill. Now they added more toxic and, and cancer-causing and more harmful substances in their body over and above hitting themselves with a hammer because right. the drug put further toxins into their body on top of the bad foods they were eating. So they're worse now. They're, it's their long-term health. And antibiotics cause cancer. You know, f- double the risk of breast cancer, 14 courses of antibiotics through your life. The point is, is that, you know, and most of them are prescribed for people who have viral infections in which they don't work. People go to doctors and doctors use fear and the people are fearful of getting sick and people give the people what they want to give the drugs that they know are cancer-causing or dangerous, and in the elderly people and the, that, that aren't going to help them anyway. Mm. And if they were going to help them, like lowering their blood pressure to prevent a stroke or lowering their blood pressure to hurt their kidneys, then it would have been better if they had used, or diabetics medication, then it would have be been better if they had used nutrition, not the drug. In the Accord study was that we took, the National Institute of Health did it in 2008, they had to stop the study, because the people had more medical care, more doctor visits and more visits with a nurse practitioner to keep their glucose in the most favorable range for the diabetics, the more they had the doctor visits, the more they kept their glucose lower, the increased their death rate rapidly. No, so really? they had to stop the study. The opposite of what they wanted. That's right. It had the opposite effect because <laughs> more control of the glucose meant more drugs. And right. the drugs make you gain weight. The drugs make, make the beta, family beta cells in the pancreas overwork themselves, pushing harder. It poops you out faster. So you become, your diabetes becomes more advanced. It leads to and more insulin and more growth promoting drugs like this make you promote cellular replication and cancer. More of these drugs cause cancer. They accelerate your, your, your diabetic parameters get worse over time. They look like they're de- temporarily getting better, but over time they make you worse. Mm. It's like bringing your car to the gas station mechanic with the oil light flashing on your dashboard, and he reaches in there with the wire clippers, and he cuts the wire to the dashboard so you can't leave the water. The, the, um, the you can't see the light anymore. flashing, <laughs> and then you drive your car with no oil, and your car bur- burns out. 
here we go to the doctor, he fixes the blood pressure with a medication or the blood glucose with a medication, but it makes you burn out the car faster. Mm. They didn't tell you about that, that you're going to burn switch to cancer from the drugs, they're going to burn out the diabetes faster, they're going to worsen and give you the drug, put in a stent in your heart mm. for, stable, for angina, and now we put a foreign body in your heart, which increases the chance of having a clot from the rest of your life. And the, by the way, putting the stent did not extend your life because it doesn't stop future heart attacks, because the vulnerable plaque isn't the most obstructive plaque that has the calcifications causing the blockage anyway. It's the other part of the heart that you don't even take, treat with the stent that's going to cause the heart attack. But mm-hmm. now they put the foreign body with the stent in your heart. Now we've got to put you on blood-thinning drugs the rest of your life. And these blood-thinning drugs now increase your risk of hemorrhagic stroke and gastrointestinal bleeding. Mm-hmm. And now you have to be on a drug. And so you're now you're, in, now you're taking port- a drug for the drug. <laughs> you're taking a drug for the drug. So now you're at higher risk of hemorrhagic stroke because you thin the blood. And then the blood pressure medication caused atrial fibrillation. So now you're, so we gave you a high risk of hemorrhagic stroke. But of course, they irritate your stomach from these thin blood thinners. Now they've got to give you a drug for that. <laughs> and those drugs weaken your bones. And, you know, and then the drug for weakening your bones, the, 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 they have women, increased risk of atrial fibrillation. We're back to that again. Oh, my God. Which is your heart, but they give you a drug. For, you know, so it's all a vicious, vicious cycle. So what I'm saying that the, it, it's bizarre, it's barbaric, and people are completely uninformed. And I would be okay if you want to get into this medical model of treating everything with a pill. And you think your life's going to be better eating the junk food to earn that. And I wouldn't have any objection to that if people were adequately informed, mm-hmm. if they had comprehensive informed consent. If they knew they were if doing If they knew it. all the risks of what they were going through, if they knew how effectively they could reverse their diabetes and get off the drug, cholesterol-lowering drugs, if they knew how the blood pressure could more be effectively treated with the right diet, and they still chose to take those drugs and going to double the risk of getting breast cancer or increase the risk of hemorrhagic stroke, if they want to go that way, go ahead. It's a free world. Mm. But I'm thinking there are millions more people that would adopt a more aggressive nutritional approach had they been given all the correct facts. Hmm. And they're, they're, not, they're, they're never made aware of. Right. Yeah. Wow. I think this is news to people. People with type 2, and sometimes type 1 diabetes, you can reverse that through diet, is what we're saying. Isn't it crazy that a person with diabetes wouldn't know they had the option to reverse it? That's what I'm saying. Isn't that crazy? They don't even know they could reverse it. Yeah. And that's what's really terrible. Generally. No. Okay, so let's let me clarify that, though, because it's yeah. important. Um, a type 2 diabetic is the type that can be reversed. Yeah. That's the person who usually is overweight, and they developed it later in life. Type 1 is those more likely to be childhood onset where their pancreas, the beta cells in the pancreas are destroyed. Right. That's not typically reversible, especially when you're catching it later on in life. However, it's so critically important that a type 1 diabetic adopts a nutritarian diet because they're conventionally treated with all the insulin they need to keep their glucose low. And they're not told that, if they, they, that they're doubling or tripling their need for insulin. They don't, if they're using 60 units a day, that's going to cut short their life by 30 years. Mm-hmm. You have to eat a diet that only requires you to use 20 units a day, not 60 units a day. In other words... What I'm saying is that mm. type 1 diabetics are kill, they're, that they're have incredible morbidity and early mortality because they're overusing insulin because the diet they're on is inappropriate for them. Mm-hmm. And even though they're still going to require some insulin, their insulin needs would be two-thirds less. They wouldn't have highs and lows, and they have a normal life to live 95 to 105 years old without having the morbidity, the kidney problems, the eye problems, the nerve problems that the diabetics are so, so typically get, leading mm-hmm. cause of blindness. And the other thing is, I do have type 1s that reverse their diabetes. Mm -hmm. But they came to me. It's a few of them, not many. It's a few that came to me when they were very young, like four- to seven-year-old kids, whose parents brought them in when they were first diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, and they immediately adopted the nutritarian diet. And as they went into their honeymoon period, they never came out. Mm. In other words... They ate so healthfully when they were just getting the diabetes at a very young age that they were able to recover from it. And eventually, the antibodies to the, against the beta cells in the pancreas start to come back to normal. And I have a lot of these kids right now that I'm treating that have type 1 diabetes, that, are off their in, that had type 1 diabetes, that are off their insulin. You can at least lower the insulin. No, they're off their insulin completely. Off they're off it. They don't have type, <laughs> they don't have type 1 anymore. They're cured. That's but but that's, not the tr- that's not most type 1 diabetics. That's only because we caught it so early so on. Early. I even have one kid that caught it before he became type 1 diabetic. They caught, the ba- they caught the antibodies in his blood cells starting to increase that would put him at higher risk of developing type 1 diabetes if he got the virus that, it, that kind of like works with the... Um, antigens to destroy the beta cells. So we got him, we, we caught him early on. So now he's on the reversal program. He never had type 1 diabetes. Hmm. But we're preventing him from getting it because he had the blood markers that indicated he was at high risk for it. Hmm. Wow. So what I'm saying to you is that I don't, <laughs> so even though I consider type 1 diabetes not a typically reversible illness, there are some cases, unique cases, where it has been reversed if we caught it very early. But the type 2 that is sometimes, I, I'm not an expert, caused by diet and, and extra or whatever it might be, can be reversed with diet. Right. Type, most type 2 diabetics are insulin resistant. Their pancreas is still producing enough insulin. 
if they eat properly, they lose weight, they get healthy, they have enough insulin production to not need medication, to have normal hemoglobin A1Cs and not be diabetic. So they're essentially non-diabetic because they have normal blood parameters and don't need medication. So Should what, they go back and eat poorly again and go gain weight again, they'll get diabetes again. But right. as long as they're eating right, they're non-diabetic. Right. I literally was concerned for you. I was like, oh, I'm going to ask Dr. Furman all these things. He's, what is a nutritarian and all this stuff? And here you are demonstrating higher level of uh, brain function and energy and passion. And I'm 95 years old. <laughs> <laughs> ah!